50% of the surface of the Earth have been neglected by geologists until the very recent past. And that's because those rocks are at the bottom of the oceans. And the bottoms of the oceans have been inaccessible until very recently, until technology allowed drilling. And some of the unsung geological expeditions of present years take place over the oceans. There are drilling ships crisscrossing the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian Oceans practically 12 months of the year. And that sort of new knowledge of the oceans is contributing to a much greater understanding of this large area of our planet. But it's still probably true to say that our maps of the moon's surface are better than our maps of the ocean floors, although that is rapidly changing due to the exploration, the present exploration of the oceans. The understanding of the nature of the rock of the ocean floors is an example of how the knowledge of many different areas has come together to give an understanding of a geological phenomenon or a geological problem, because that's what it was until very recently. The understanding of the ocean floors is another of the eureka moments in geology, like the realization that the shell of the Earth was divided into plates. When you watch this hour, you might like to remember one of the geological cliches, and that is that gases and liquids forget, but rocks remember. When you get to the second half of the coming hour, see if you can understand the sense of that expression. But the first half of the hour is the Planet of Man program, The Challenge of the Deep. This program is about the sediments on the deep sea floor. These are important for two reasons. One is that heretofore we knew nothing about them because we had no means of studying them. The other is that recently it's become realized that mankind is in danger of facing shortages of some metals and fuels. And the ocean floors, which cover a larger area of the Earth's surface than do the continents, may provide a reservoir of oil and many metals which will be important in the future economy of the world. Man stands always on the edge. Awed by power and vastness. But like Narcissus gazing into the pool, man looks and sees only a reflection of himself. From the earliest discovery that he could sit astride a log and float, Man learned to travel with the wind and the waves. With the mastery of water transport came sea power, trading, and colonization. In 1966, Isambard Kingdom Brunel built a huge iron ship, the Great Eastern. 
that paddle wheeled and propelled her way across the Atlantic. In her wake, she lay the first successful transatlantic telegraph link. With the practical aim of improving communication and making money, exploration of the ocean floor suddenly became a reality. With interest at a high, Her Majesty's ship Challenger was dispatched to explore the deep seas. Challenger was the first scientific ship committed to major ocean investigation. After a voyage of three and a half years and 70,000 miles, she returned home in 1875. Over a hundred years later, we are still the pragmatists, still exploring the ocean. Probing a landscape far more extraordinary than anything above the surface of the sea. Like blind men with canes four miles long, we seek the sea for the benefit of mankind and a healthy profit. Today, there are new demands for every kind of raw material. And these demands have modified our interest in the deep sea, from communication cables to oil and minerals. By the end of this century, the demand for resources will have multiplied many times. Facing future shortages, we are forced to develop both an understanding of the deep sea with its potential riches and a technology to exploit them. That understanding and technology began on the Challenger expedition. They discovered soft clay deposits that covered the seabed, and for want of a better name, they called it ooze. The ocean floor is covered by material that has been accumulating for over a hundred million years. Sedimentation. The slow, silent rain of material from the surface. The sudden, violent rush of turbid water into the ocean depths. The unbelievably slow growth of new minerals out of the seawater itself. Much of the material that accumulates in the deep sea is created by the destruction of rocks on the continent. In a single day, Canada's rivers alone carry 25 million tons of land into the sea. Sediment carried by rivers, sea currents, wind, glaciers, and drifting ice. Another source is the teeming animal and plant life, the microorganisms living in the ocean. skeletons of these tiny plankton sink slowly to the seafloor after death. They form a major part of the organic ooze that blankets the submarine topography.
mystery of the underwater landscape was uncovered with the development of the echo sounder. By bouncing sound pulses off the sea floor, a continuous and precise depth record is obtained. time, a detailed view of the ocean floor evolves. A hidden landscape, never seen by man, only felt with an electronic cane. Three quarters of the surface of his planet. The continental shelf is the shallow margin closest to the landmass. The shelf extends about 200 kilometers offshore, reaching an average depth of 200 meters. Geologically, the continental shelf is part of the continental landmass. The shelves are covered in terrigenous sediment, material derived from the weathering of rocks, materials made from the shells and skeletons of plants and animals that lived there in the shallow water, closest to the sun. The mollusks, algae, corals, and snails. Hidden reserves of gas and oil lie trapped beneath many of the world's continental shelves. It is estimated that 19% of the world's production of petroleum comes from offshore operations on the continental shelf. Beyond the edge of the continental shelf, the ocean floor descends gradually to depths of three and four kilometers. This region of steeper grade leading to the deep sea is called the continental slope and marks the transition from the continent to the ocean depths. Oceanographers have probed the continental slopes and found deep gorges and canyons cut into its face. These submarine canyons course through the sea bottom for hundreds of miles and lead onto broad, flat plains. The development of a coring technology provided a new perspective into the submarine canyons. A piston corer can obtain samples of seabed up to 25 meters in length. extracted from the outer ends of the submarine canyons yield some startling information. While the seabed at this depth was expected to consist for the most part of thick deposits of fine oozes, accumulated by slow settling through the water column. The cores, in fact, revealed material like that found on the continental shelf, nearly 200 kilometers away, and in water less than 50 meters deep. taken along the canyon route show evidence of erosion through beds of clay millions of years old.
This evidence suggests that canyons were cut into the continental slopes by powerful undersea avalanches or currents. Turbidity currents, torrents of sediment-laden water flowing down the slopes. Denser than the surrounding seawater, turbidity currents deposit their loads on the seafloor at the base of the slopes. On November 18, 1929, a severe earthquake shook the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. 13 international telegraph cables were torn apart. At that time, the cable breaks were attributed to the earthquake. However, a study of these breaks by Dr. Bruce Heason of the Lamont Doherty Geological Observatory revealed a different cause. After this earthquake, 13 submarine cables that linked the United States with Europe were broken. For a distance of 600 miles to the south, one cable after another broke along a 200 mile length until at 13 hours and 17 minutes after the earthquake, the last cable broke. What had happened? It was our hypothesis, the same thing had happened in 1929 to produce these sand beds, namely a suspension of mud and water known as a turbidity current, which flowed at tremendous velocities downslope carrying down these big loads of sediment. But how to prove it? Well, the obvious way was to find if similar deposits were found south of the Grand Banks as we'd already found in the Hudson Canyon. So a couple years later, we were able to get a ship and go out and take a core, a series of cores, in fact, of which this is representative. And these cores showed an upper layer about a meter thick of silt and sand, and then an abrupt break and ooze below. The ooze of the same kind that Challenger Expedition had described in the late part of the 19th century. We had the evidence from the cores. We had the analogy with the other canyons. And geological theory at that point was ripe. So a revolution in thinking was born. And from then on, there was really no doubt that the great abyssal plains, they were formed by these floodings of set, silt and sand, the uh, result of the turbidity current. Turbidity currents can roll on for hundreds of miles, spreading out thick new layers of sediment as they lose momentum. Between brief episodes of turbidity current sedimentation, the slow, steady rain of pelagic sediment continues unabated. This immense wedge of sediment at the foot of the slope is the continental rise. Seismographic testing on the continental rise confirmed the presence of different layers of sediment. DIDR, this is KSLF, KSLF, on the air for shot 987, 987. A 300-pound shot, 31-inch fuse. Take it in 30 seconds. Explosions produce sound waves that travel through rock and sediment on the ocean floor. Part of the sound energy is reflected back to the ship from each of the sediment layers. These reflections are recorded and yield a detailed profile of a layered ocean bottom. 
a laminated sandwich composed of coarse grain turbidite sands and rich organic muddy ooze. This muddy sediment found in the continental rise may reveal a new source of resource riches. Oil and gas originate where organic sediment has been left to decay for many thousands or millions of years. Oil slowly rises through the overlying sediments until its flow is blocked. As petroleum geologists say, it enters a trap. The porous sandy turbidites of the continental rise are an ideal location to store and trap petroleum. Covered by a thick, impermeable layer of muddy pelagic sediment, the petroleum is prevented from leaking out. Dr. Heason speculates on the oil potential of the continental rise. There's a strong probability that the three basic requirements for the accumulation of petroleum can be found in the continental rise. This arises due to the fact that the early ocean, uh, early Atlantic Ocean, was very tight and restricted, often became stagnant, uh, laying down very black organic muds, and also sometimes dried up, laying down salts. Afterwards, turbidity currents carried in sands and left perhaps thick beds of such sands on the continental rise. Petroleum migrated up from the black muds below into the sands, but didn't migrate all the way into the ocean because by that time pelagic muds had created a blanket which turned into shale, which covered the whole sequence. As more and more sediment was deposited, the salts uh, became compressed and started migrating upwards and building structures and arching up the shales, thus having all the necessary requirements, source beds, reservoir rocks, and structure for petroleum. No one has drilled it yet, but the volume involved is so large that if oil does occur there, it could be equal to, let's say, five or 10 Arabias. Until recently, commercial drilling was not feasible past a depth of three or 400 feet. The deeper the water, the greater the problems at the wellhead. The advent of a semi-submersible drilling rig moved offshore oil and gas exploration into deeper water. Towed to location, the drilling platform is stabilized on submersible pontoons. Taller than a 28-story building, the platform is designed to withstand hostile weather conditions that can bring 20 to 40-foot waves, choking blizzards, and icebergs. New advances in drilling technology have extended the underwater reach beyond the edges of the continental shelf. The search for deep sea resources calls for the range and mobility of a ship, a very special ship designed for exploration and drilling in the deepest seas. The deepest parts of the ocean floor are the abyssal plains, four to six kilometers from the surface. They are vast, monotonous expanses, the flattest regions on Earth. Sedimentation in these regions far removed from the continent is very slow, frequently less than one centimeter in a thousand years. In the deepest regions of the world's oceans, the calcium carbonate shells of plankton begin to dissolve, leaving behind a brown, muddy sediment, red clay. This very fine pelagic sediment 
is composed of plankton remains. In these areas of the seafloor, where the rates of sedimentation are the slowest, chemical sedimentation assumes greater importance. The direct formation of minerals from the seawater itself. The most common of these chemical sediments are manganese nodules. First discovered by the Challenger, these rock-like balls and slabs contain a generous proportion of manganese, as well as nickel, copper, and cobalt. Commodities which, by the turn of the century, will be in very short supply from continental deposits. These sedimentary lumps have occasionally formed around whalebone or shark's teeth. Manganese nodules have yet to be fully commercially mined. The cost of developing deep-sea mining techniques is astronomical. But facing diminishing resources, mining technology is moving beyond the discussion stage. It is an irony that some believe we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the surface of the deep sea floor. The world hasn't fully submitted to man's exploring eye or his eternal quest for treasure. Optimistic predictions are often heard of man exploiting the sea for its unlimited riches. In fact, we are now witnessing a great leap forward in ocean technology. And it appears to be only a beginning. But the move into deeper water does not guarantee success. Scraping the sea for sources of ore is far from a commercial reality. Oil drilling has only ventured past the 600-foot depth, and a single production platform can cost $120 million. Our appetite for resources has become the greatest incentive for challenging the deep. But the sea is not conquered. It resists advances and still guards many of its oldest and darkest secrets. It guards them deep, deep below an often seething surface.
There are many different ways of looking at oceans. Oceanographers, for example, are concerned with the depth of the ocean and the circulation of the ocean water with its temperature and with its salinity and with its chemistry. Geologists are interested in different aspects of the oceans, and two of those have been illustrated in the film you've just seen. We're concerned with the sediments of the ocean floors, how they're deposited, what they're composed of, what their general characteristics are, because we must be able to recognize those sediments when we see them again as rocks in the geological record. Another aspect of the oceans that we're interested in was also illustrated in the film. Oceans as the source of potential mineral deposits. The manganese nodules are only one of the possible min mineral resources of the oceans. In fact, the ocean water itself may one day be used as a source of the elements which are dissolved in it. But the aspect of the oceans that we want to talk about in the next half hour is different from those two that you saw in the film. We're concerned with the bedrock of the ocean floors, the, the rock which lies beneath the, the sediments. You're already familiar with the fact that the ocean floors are formed of the igneous rock basalt, and that that rock is intruded in the spreading ridges that are usually found in, toward the center of the oceans, and that there the oceanic lithosphere grows. Such a spreading ridge is down the center of the Atlantic. Quite down the center of the Atlantic. This is not always the case in the Pacific the spreading ridge where the basalt is intruded to form the uh, lithospheric plate of the Pacific is not in the center. But that's just a variation. You're also familiar with the fact that the oceanic lithosphere is destroyed down subduction zones where island arcs are built, such as Japan. Now, that picture that did you already have of the ocean floors is rather a difficult one to understand and was rather a difficult one for scientists to accept without good evidence, without a good understanding of the nature of the bedrock of the ocean floors. The oceans, in fact, if we look at them, uh, are rather like a giant conveyor belt system. And the evidence for that picture of the ocean floors as a conveyor belt system comes from the nature of the uh, observation of the Earth's magnetic field over the oceans. During the Second World War, very sensitive magnetometers were developed, that is, instruments which detect the strength and the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. They were developed in order to detect submarines in the, the oceans, in fact. After the Second World War, those same instruments were diverted to a different use. They were diverted to observing the strength and the direction of the Earth's magnetic field itself for scientific purposes. And when those magnetometers were flown over the oceans, such as the Atlantic, for example, it was found that there was a pattern to the magnetic field over the oceans, a pattern that looks rather like this. A pattern of bands where the Earth's magnetic field was strengthened and weakened, alternately strengthened and weakened. The black bands here representing a band where the Earth's magnetic field was a little stronger than it was expected to be. The white bands representing bands where the Earth's magnetic field was a little weaker than it was expected to be. Now, at first, that information was very puzzling. Uh, this was just after the Second World War. It became possible to understand it when people realized how rocks behave after they've crystallized as they're cooling. Remember what the rock of the ocean floor is. It's basalt. And remember what basalt is composed of. It's composed of ferromagnesian minerals, that is, minerals rich in iron and magnesium. Now, most of them, of course, are silicates, silicates like pyroxene, for example. But there's also another iron mineral commonly present in basalt, the mineral magnetite, which is iron oxide. And the behavior of the iron oxide, in particular the behavior, behavior of the atoms of iron in the iron oxide, is very interesting. The atoms of iron don't behave like the perfect spherical little atoms that we've thought of so far. They behave, in fact, like little magnets. They're 
the atomic particles which make up the atom, organize themselves in such a fashion that the atom has a north pole and a south pole, just like any little bar magnet that you can, you can buy in a store, but of course on a, on a minute scale. And when the basalt crystallizes, these little magnets, these little ion atoms, behave in a very interesting fashion. What happens after the rock is crystallized, and these are all individual crystals, and here is a, a magnetite grain enclosed within them, and these are the little iron atoms, or some of them. What happens is, at temperatures of about seven or 800 degrees, that the north poles of these iron atoms point in all kinds of different directions, all kinds of random directions, because remember, they're quite hot, and they're moving around very rapidly. They're not oriented in any particular uh, direction. They're, they're rotating in their places in the mineral structure of the, the magnetite. As the temperature drops and reaches a point about 580 degrees centigrade, that we call the Curie point, those atoms arrange themselves so that the north poles of the atoms all point in the same direction. And that same direction is the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the place where the rock, the basalt, with its contained magnetite grains, has solidified and cooled. And if you take that piece of basalt or that grain of magnetite and you heat it up again, then the directions of the north poles of the ion atoms will once again become random. And the, the magnetite and the basalt loses its magnetism. You can do the same thing with a nail. If you, you magnetize a nail and uh, hang it on a magnet and heat up the nail, then the nail will fall off the magnet because it loses the ability to become magnetized. It's the same kind of associated behavior of the ion atoms. So that explains then why the basalt of the ocean floors is magnetized, because it contains grains of magnetite, and within the magnetite are ion atoms behaving like little north and south pole magnets. But does it explain why the ocean floor is magnetized in bands? Why there are bands of weak and strong magnetism that we spoke of? Of course it doesn't. Or does it? Well, Consider when the basalt becomes magnetized. It becomes magnetized as it cools from a, from a molten liquid. And where does the molten liquid reach the floors of the ocean? The molten basalt reaches the floors of the ocean in dikes and lava flows in the mid-ocean ridges. In other words, the molten basalt of the ocean floors cools and solidifies in bands, cools and solidifies along the center of the mid-ocean ridges. But does that explain why the ocean floor is magnetized in bands? It explains why, how the ocean floor grows in bands, how the molten material is added in bands, but does, explain, does it explain why it's magnetized in bands? Of course it doesn't. We still can't explain it. But a second very important observation regarding the magnetic field does help us. And that very important observation is that although the north pole of a magnet at present points to the north pole of the Earth, this doesn't seem always to have been the case in the past. In fact, it seems that the present north pole has in the past, at times, pointed, in fact, to the south. And at other times, has pointed in the way that it does today, to the north, and at other times, to the south, and so on. This is an extraordinary observation, and it was a great surprise to scientists when it was first discovered. It was discovered in a variety of different ways. For example, in Australia, the stones which Aborigines had laid around their campfire about 30,000 years ago and had heated above the Curie point were taken back to the laboratory, now of course cool, and there it was found that the magnetic field, the direction of the magnetic field, that those once hot stones had preserved in them was opposite. The direction was opposite 
to the direction of the present Earth's magnetic field. In other words, the North Pole in those rocks was where the South Pole is now, and the South Pole is where the North Pole is now. In other words, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field in those rocks heated above the Curie point 30,000 years ago was exactly opposite to what it is today. The Earth's magnetic field was, in fact, reversed. And that observation has been confirmed in, for example, the lavas of volcanoes. This is a cross-section of a volcano, a volcano sliced down the middle, if you like. And you can see it formed of a succession of hundreds of lava flows erupted over the last million years or so. And as you might expect, the lava reaching the surface and pouring out on the flanks of the volcano at the present day has preserved within it the current direction, the present direction of the Earth's magnetic field, north to the north, if you like. And we've represented this by the red layer on this enlargement of the pile of lava. If we were to dig down into the volcano and find lavas about 30,000 years old, we find that the lava preserves the opposite direction of that at present, thus confirming the observation made on the stones that the Aborigines heated above the Curie point about 30,000 years ago and which subsequently cooled to preserve the magnetic field at that time. The North Pole points to the south. Between about 30,000 and 800,000 years ago, the lavas, colored orange in this pile, preserve the present direction of the Earth's magnetic field. Evidently, at that time, north was to the north, so to speak. But about 800,000 years ago, once again, the North Pole points to the south. And there are a pile of lavas erupted over several tens of thousands of years, which preserve a reverse direction from at present. For a short time, the present direction was the current one. And then about 900,000 and a million years ago, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field preserved in the lavas is opposite to the present day. What we seem to be looking at there, in fact, is a similar pattern to that that we've seen on the ocean floor, except that it's vertical instead of horizontal. And that pattern in the volcano exists because of two facts. The fact that the Earth's magnetic field has reversed every now and again, and the fact also that when it reverses, when north, north becomes south, the direction of magnetization, the direction in which the little magnets in the magnetite point stays the same because that magnetite is at a lower temperature than its Curie point. Those two observations put together give us an explanation for the bands of um, reinforced and diminished magnetism over the floor of the, the oceans. Let's go back to that diagram showing the dikes of the ocean floor. Remember that the dikes of the ocean floor split the ocean floor, rather like driving in a wedge. And that instead of a vertical pile of lavas recording the changes in the Earth's magnetic field, as in the volcano, we have a symmetrical record on either side of the ridge, rather like a tape recorder. And where the magnetic field in the rocks points to the south, as in the black bands here, then clearly the rocks diminish the strength of the magnetic field that we observe when we take a magnet magnetometer over the ocean floor. Where the record in the rocks points to the north and strengthens the magnetic field, then we get a band of reinforced magnetism. Confirmation of the um, the picture of the ocean floor as spreading like a conveyor belt was obtained also from the age of the rocks of the ocean floor. The age of the rocks we can represent by the colored stripes 
of this diagram. The most recent rocks here in the dark red are clearly present day and have an age that we could call zero, if you like. As we move out from the center of the ocean toward the coasts, each of these bands represents rocks that are uh, range in age of about 30 million years. So this would be a band of 0 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, 90 to 120, 120 to 150. And finally, the rocks closest to the uh, coast of Africa are about 180 million years old. These are very, very young rocks. The rocks that we know on the continents range in age up to, oh, well over 3,500 million years old whereas these rocks of the oceans are about 180 million years old in the case of the Atlantic. And off the um, west coast of South America, for example, the age of the rocks of the ocean floor there is only about 40 million years. And the youth of the ocean rocks and the progressive increase in age of the ocean rocks towards the continents which border the oceans is confirmation of that picture of the oceans as conveyor belts spreading from the center. Now, that picture of the oceans as growing is, in fact, if you don't look at it very carefully, a misleading one. The oceans certainly are spreading, spreading from the center. But in fact, they're not growing in area. It's the land of the Earth which is growing in area, growing in area because the oceanic crust which is being created at the uh, spreading, spreading ridges is being reprocessed at the subduction zones and that reprocessing which produces island arcs of andesitic composition leads to an increase in the area of land at the expense of the oceans. In fact land is being created at the, a rate of about 50 acres per year by the reprocessing of oceanic crust. So we can look on the oceans not just as spreading conveyor belts, but as a kind of a factory, a factory that eventually leads to the production of land. And the oceans, far from growing, are in fact contracting, and that is the land which is growing in area. We can look at the, uh, the growth of the land by looking at the details of the volcanic processes which produce the island arcs from the oceanic crust. The question we must ask is, how can we melt basalt, basalt crust, and produce island arcs of a lighter rock more akin to granite? In order to understand the essence, the, the important part of the volcanic processes which recycle ocean lithosphere and make island arcs out of it, I'd like you to cast your mind back to the program on igneous rocks and remember what happened when igneous rocks solidified. You remember that the, the important point was that the minerals of the igneous rocks did not all form at once. The minerals formed in a certain order. And you could imagine that process taking place by thinking of the atoms moving in the liquid and gradually ordering themselves into minerals as the temperature dropped. Certain of the atoms seeking out the oxygen silicon tetrahedra and forming minerals at high temperatures, and other different atoms seeking out oxygen silicon tetrahedra at lower temperatures and forming different minerals. Now, I'd like you to try and retain the germ of that idea in your head as we look at the way that igneous rocks melt and what happens when their temperature is raised. Because this is a complex process. Imagine the, uh, the temperature of the rock being raised and the minerals then beginning to melt in the opposite order in which they crystallized. You can well imagine, I think, that the uh, mineral which forms at a high temperature will stay solid longer than the mineral which formed at a low temperature. So in essence, the minerals begin to melt in the opposite order in which they, they crystallized. That's, that's one aspect of the melting of rocks. Now when the minerals, in fact, themselves begin to melt, they react together. You can imagine two 
different beginning to melt minerals reacting with one another. So that's a second point that happens. Now, a third thing that happens has to do with exactly how those minerals melt. And this is perhaps the most difficult thing to, to understand. Try and imagine a mineral, let's say a crystal of pyroxene, for example, getting hotter. Now, you'll remember that pyroxene, which is an important mineral in, in basalt, is one of a family of minerals. That is, in some pyroxenes, there's a lot of calcium. In other pyroxenes, there's a lot of magnesium. And the more calcium you have, the less magnesium you have. The more magnesium you have, the less calcium you have. So that when pyroxene, in fact, begins to melt, what happens is that some of those atoms come out of the pyroxene crystal, and other atoms take their place. There's an exchange between calcium and magnesium. So that when that pyroxene begins to melt, the pyroxene crystal itself changes to another member of its family. And at the same time, it yields atoms to, if the temperature is gradually rising, it yields atoms to a liquid. So try and, and have in your mind the picture then of minerals beginning to melt in the reverse order in which they crystallized, that minerals reacting together, and also certain elements coming out of some minerals as the temperature rises and being replaced by other ones. That's all rather difficult to imagine, but let's transfer that to the sites of the, uh, the igneous activity and just see what happens in actual geological practice, so to speak. The rock of the asthenosphere beneath the site of a splitting ridge, in fact, beneath any piece of lithosphere, is this kind of rock that we have here. It's a rather green-looking rock with some brown um, crystals on it. They're, in fact, crystals of garnet. The green background is formed of the minerals olivine and pyroxene. And that's the rock that we think makes up the asthenosphere. Let's put those minerals, the garnet, the pyroxene, and the olivine, beneath the diagram there and see what happens when that rock melts. Garnet, then, is one of the main constituents of the rock of the asthenosphere. The others are, we think, pyroxene and olivine. Now, when that rock of the asthenosphere melts, the process is just as complicated as I described to you a couple of minutes ago. Briefly and simply, what we think happens is that calcium and sodium are released from the pyroxene. And they go to form that part of the liquid, which will eventually crystallize as plagioclase. And the sodium and calcium from the pyroxene are accompanied in the liquid by aluminum, which is derived from the beginnings of the melting of the garnet. So that these two minerals, sorry, these two, the pyroxene and the garnet, as they begin to melt, contribute to the, that part of the, the molten material, which will eventually crystallize as plagioclase. The pyroxene, having lost its, some of its sodium and calcium, when it eventually melts and then crystallizes again, forms a different pyroxene. The olivine, although it doesn't actually behave in detail like this, you can regard as having simply melted and recrystallized again. And these minerals, plagioclase, pyroxene, and olivine, derived from the beginnings of the melting of the asthenosphere, form the rock basalt. And that, then, is what we think, approximately simplified, happens at a spreading center like this. The asthenosphere begins to melt. About 10% of it probably melts and forms the oceanic lithosphere. Now then, when that basalt goes down a subduction zone, let's take the minerals over here and see what happens to it as it goes down a subduction zone. The olivine, pyroxene, 
and plagioclase. Without going into detail, what happens then is that sodium and potassium are released from these constituents, constituent minerals, and some aluminum and some silica. These are released as the basalt begins to go down a subduction zone, either beneath a continent or beneath another piece of ocean lithosphere. The rock that's then produced is andesite, composed of plagioclase. Let's take these away. Plagioclase and amphibole, essentially. So what we've seen, then, is we've seen a sort of a one-way street. The creation of oceanic lithosphere by the partial melting of the asthenosphere, producing basalt, and the reprocessing of that basalt to produce andesite, andesite of the volcanic island arcs, or the volcanoes on the margin of a continent. That andesite is this rock. And as well as being light colored, it's light in weight, and it never sinks again down a subduction zone. Once it's formed as land, it remains land. And looking at that pattern of volcanic activity and, well, volcanic activity at spreading ridges and volcanic activity at subduction zones gives us some hints as to why and how those plates of oceanic lithosphere might move. We get some hints as to the mechanism of plate tectonics. Hot material at the spreading ridges formed into the oceanic lithospheric plates, cooling as it moves away from the, um, <coughs> the splitting ridge to the margins of continents, or descending down a subduction zone here. Cooling and getting heavier, and perhaps sinking down this subduction zone because it's heavy but perhaps because it's part of a convection system, getting hotter here, melting, hot, cool, hot, cool, and so on. Part of a convection system like that. That's a second possibility, that the lithosphere is, in fact, a part of a convection so system involving the asthenosphere. Perhaps also the plates move because hot material is squeezed up into here in gaps, pushing those plates apart. Whichever mechanism it is, the oceans are, if you like, the factory for the production of the continents. Hello. I'm Mike McManus, executive producer in TV Ontario's part-time learning area. Thanks in part to the support of TV Ontario's 38,000 members, we're broadcasting four new part-time learning series this fall, and there are more to come in the winter and spring. If programs that inform as they entertain are important to you, we hope that you'll call in a donation during TV Ontario's upcoming public membership campaign. Become a member of TV Ontario, November 3rd to 15th. Hello, I'm Suzanne Grew Ellis for Realities. Political scientist Langdon Winner is our guest on Wednesday. In the first of two interviews with Richard Gwynne, he warns of the dangers of embracing the new technologies without stopping to think of their effect on society. On the following night, the Canadian obsession with nationalism is the topic as Richard Gwynne talks to recent Governor General's award winner, Ramsey Cook, about his latest book. Watch Realities Wednesday and Thursday at 8.30 and 11 on TV Ontario. This is TV Ontario, Channel 19 in Toronto, Channel 53 in Belleville. 